Oh, goodness, I've lost the track of it. I think it's 14 days after they've hatched, or maybe 16 days after they've hatched. But everything is not uh, as easy as you would think. They do face lots of perils. In fact, here we see a crow, and that crow was attacking another hummingbird nest, which was higher up in a tree. And this is always a problem for hummingbirds. You can hear Mama Hummingbird, Holly, chirping in the background, and these crows were staking out the forest looking for them. And if you watch just a second, you'll see just how close they are to the little hummingbird nest. Holly's nest is right down in this little holly bush down here. And as I focus in, you're going to see little Barry stick his butt up over the edge of the nest and let go of the little poop. And that's how hummingbirds clean the poop. That's how they poop, right from the start. They always get their butts out of the nest. Another peril is little mites. You can see mites in the tips of their beaks there. And these mites sometimes get very, very invasive. The mites can kill the chicks, but there's nothing we can do about it to stop them from doing, from, uh, there's nothing we can do about it to stop the, the mites. If we put any poison in there, it'll kill the birds. So all we can do is help, is hope that they don't uh, get too overwhelming. But you can see that the mites are just crawling on the mama and babies. And this is kind of a problem for them. It tends to happen only in the later part of the summer. I've never seen mites on a hummingbird before June. Now that just might be my own particular case, but I think as the weather gets warmer, the mites get more resilient and uh, probably in their breeding cycle they get a little bit uh, stronger and, and survive longer. So during the last week, the little chicks had to put up with the mites, and all they could do is sit there and scratch, which they spent an awful long time doing. Uh, they do eat the mites, but the mites, uh, you know, there's a lot of them. But this is also how they preen themselves. They make sure they clean all their feathers off. And then one day, little Holly jump or Barry leapt out of the nest and uh, that left Bush in there but it wasn't very long before Bush decided he could fly away too and here you can see him getting ready to do it he's a little bit hesitant and if you have a look at their feet their feet tend to grasp onto the nest it's only when the hummingbird is really ready to fly that they can unclench their feet and fly away so hummingbirds don't fall out of the nest like other birds they tend to fly away from the nest. And they tend to fly to a little branch somewhere close by that they can see. And here's a little bush hanging on to a tree uh, that he's flown to. And he's going to have to learn the difference between landing on a horizontal branch or a vertical branch. He's having a little bit of trouble grabbing onto that branch. See, he had to figure it out. But he found another horizontal branch, and then about half an hour after he fledged, his mom came along again and gives him food. And mom will follow him around the forest for about two weeks and feed them about every half hour or so. But it will get a longer period of time as the weeks go on. And you can see here that he's actually not very far away from the nest, only about 10 feet. And that's pretty good for a first flight. And then they start to find their way among the forest and they start to get a little bit more adventurous. And they start to taste things. You can see little berry here uh, starting to lick at the different things in the forest. And they'll be picking up little bugs, and little bits of nectar, and stuff like that. So it, it takes about a week and a half, maybe a week, before they can start to feed themselves. But they do find things occasionally as they poke around. And you can hear that high-pitched peep, and that's how the little hummingbird chick calls for its mother. And mom can hear that anywhere in the forest. That little high-pitched peep travels very, very far. The, the, 
fathers don't participate at all in this process. The male hummingbirds are very absent. They, once they've mated, they go on and they live in, in the forest and uh, have nothing to do with the chicks or the nest. You can see that Barry's beak has gotten quite a bit longer in the few days that he's been out of the nest. One reason why little hummingbird chicks look as big or bigger than their mothers is because as they're young and they don't have the strength of the muscles, their feathers have to be a little bit bigger and a little bit fluffier to help them compensate for the weak muscles to fly. So when you take a look at a hummingbird chick and an adult, you'll see that the hummingbird chick is almost the same size. And when you see the hummingbird chicks doing this, you know they're going to be okay. And I'd like to thank Jada Kelly for her fine music in that episode there. So there's a few questions there. Uh, how long before the chick can feed themselves? Well, about uh, about a week to 10 days or so, and then they, they should be fairly normal themselves uh, as far as um, they'll take care of themselves at that point. And um, let's see, what else? Where's the dad? Yep. The fathers do not participate at all. I have once seen the father scare another bird off from the territory. Now I'm going to show you another film here. Uh, this is another hummingbird family and this one took place in my yard and this is going to show you a little bit more of what the birds go through and how they learn because I was able to capture a lot of interaction between Sugar and her two chicks, Spice and Nice. And Eric, just so you're aware, your camera's not on, and you may have planned it that way. No, it just went off by itself, but that's all right. I'm not that important to the show. So here we have Sugar, and she's got a nest in a pear tree. And she's a uh, she's, she's an Anna's hummingbird living in my yard. And the chicks have just hatched. She has to be very careful as she feeds them. And if you look closely, you can sometimes see a bug transferring from the beak to the gullet of the, uh, of the bird. Chicks have what's called the crop, and that's what mother feel, fills up, and that's where they store their food until they're ready to, di to digest it. You can see it through the transparent skin of the throat of the chick. About 20 days old now. You see those little remnants of white up at the base of their beak? Those are little pin feathers, and that's how feathers develop on birds. They come out as little spikes covered in a keratin's uh, material, which they have to preen off in order to fluff up the feathers. And when Mother Fink thinks they're ready to go, she'll give them as much help as she can including pulling little feathers off of them. There he goes! Which leaves the other one wondering what it should do. A little, little nice just flew a couple of feet away to another branch and then made his way around the pear tree and when he got hungry he called for mom and sugar came along and fed the little chick. When the chick lands in a tree waiting for the mom, they will often stay there for quite some time, like hours and hours, because they're not used to flying around much. And sometimes they take comfort in sitting beside each other. This is a very rare occurrence where the two chicks are sitting beside each other, though, and getting fed by mom. And they do actually play. You can see here, little Spice decides to knock nice off the branch, which wasn't so nice. Now they're getting to the age where they have to start to hunt for themselves. Mom will come around probably every 45 minutes to an hour now and feed them. And we're going to get into the educational part of how the bird learns here. 
So when they're sitting in the tree and they're hungry, mum will come along and start feeding at the flowers. They learn by imitation. So when the little chick is hungry and sees mom doing stuff, then they start to pick away at things around them. In this one, if you look very closely down, when he looks at the branch, you'll see that the hummingbirds actually have a split tongue. So just a second. He's going to look at the stalk at the berry bush there just a bit. And this is how mom teaches them to hunt flies. She's zipping off and catching little flies and not feeding them. And the little chick is getting perturbed. But it doesn't take long before the chick learns how to catch a fly themselves. And that's the best thing. Now here's another chick, a hummingbird, catching flies. And this is what you'll see in the forest. They'll just jump out there and grab a little fly. Now they also get dirty and they like to wash. You'll often see, well, sometimes see, little chicks cleaning themselves on blackberry bushes. And then they learn that flowers are a source of food. And pretty soon they're going all around your garden and picking up bugs. Fairly soon, this ends up, uh, fairly soon, Mom will stop feeding them. It's always nice to see the full-grown chicks taking care of themselves. So that's the end of the uh, films that I was going to show today. But if you have questions, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up my... Um, file box and I will attempt to find anything if you have any questions about what hummingbirds do I have a huge library of films and I'll do what I can to uh, pick up uh, and show you films of different different birds so let's see if we got any questions on there I know there's a group of grade four kids out there that must have lots of questions maybe what I'll do is I will show oh, there is one there from uh... Eric, there is one there from Debbie. Once the okay. chicks grow up, do they ever see their mum or siblings again? Oh. And how fast uh, do hummingbirds travel? Right. Hummingbirds travel very fast. Uh, apparently, they can go up to about 60 miles an hour when they get into one of their power dives, which is quite hard, uh, which is you know pretty hard to measure, but that's, that's what they are able to do. And hummingbirds don't associate much with their mother and sibling after they leave but they do t the resident hummingbirds here do tend to stay in the area so they will it'll be like living in a community but they don't interact much for the most part they are fairly uh, uh, independent and they they basically just go about their business in eating and making nests and reproducing hummingbirds like a lot of other birds run a lot on uh, instinct so a lot of the things that they do they probably have no idea how they do it but of course they they have to do it as as a bird you know they have to learn how to do that sort of thing so give me just a second here get my file working and yeah, I'm seeing. We, pardon me. I'm seeing we've had a few more people join us, Eric. So yeah, any video and things you can put up would be great while we continue the conversation going on. Okay. And those of you that have just just started to join us, please let me know where you're located and if there's anybody else with you other than just yourself, because it's fascinating that we're finding people all the way from LA over to New York State right now and up into Burlington and Victoria right. and Kimberly. We're all over the place having a great time today. Oh, Victoria, so great, Carolyn. Anybody else with you at this point? So here we have uh, some chicks hatching. So this is really hard footage to get, of course, because you need uh, things have to happen to be copacetic. I'm going to play that once more. And uh, you can see the little feet coming out of the shell, and they're starting to kick, it, kick off the shell and get out of there. And these little chicks were quite active. And try to remember how small it is that I'm filming here. Remember, those little eggshells are the size of coffee beans. So this is very, very tiny. All right, so, and I will show you the first time mother sees them 
here she comes. This was between hatchings. This is the first time she's fed this, feeding this little chick. And she has to be so careful putting her beak in there. She puts down a little bit of liquid and opens up the throat passage of the chick so that it learns how to accept food. Now, the way the chicks know to raise their head is because of those little feathery bits on their back. Those are like little sensors. So when the wind of the mother's wings tickle them, they raise their head. That's just something they do by instinct. And if you ever come across a hummingbird nest, if you blow gently across the top of it, the little chick may just raise its head up if it's, if it's a young one. Now, we've got some questions there. Uh, let's see. Got... No, I, I think uh, the question there from Debbie, can you inform us briefly about the migration practices? Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, a lot of hummingbirds, and I will go to Miss Rufus. Miss um, Rufus is a uh, Rufus hummingbird, and she migrates up from Mexico. It's a very long way for such a little bird, but that's what they do. They'll come up for about four or five months of the year. They arrive in our area about the end of March, and they'll set up a nest, have a chick or and maybe two nests, and then they will go back to Mexico around August, uh, later part of September. And while they're doing that, they often love to have showers here. During the hot summers that, that we sometimes experience on the West Coast, uh, we had about uh, oh, two months without any rain. And I put on the sprinkler one day, and Lady Rufus showed up and decided to take a shower. So siblings sometimes hang out together, um, but not for very long. But they will uh, tend to... Uh, a sibling will be able to eat at the same feeder as its other, as the siblings. Um, often, little birds, the hummingbirds, uh, like to have the feeder all to themselves. So they'll often come and um, try to scare the other birds off. <clears throat> but little Lady Rufus really enjoyed this, and she would come around every. Uh, well, a few days in a row when I put the sprinkler on, and then I suppose she went off to Mexico. So. So something you can do if you want to have uh, hummingbirds come and enjoy your yard is you can get a little fountain. So a little sprinkler works, but you know, a sprinkler is only on as long as you're there. But if you have a little fountain, oftentimes hummingbirds will come and uh, enjoy the fountain and take a bath. And this is something that they've come to like in my yard. And sometimes when they're there, this goes back to your sibling question, uh, siblings, when they're still young, they will play together. And here you see one little hummingbird and you can just imagine that the, uh, in a second here, you'll see that its sibling comes along and does what siblings do best. Pushes him into the pool and then stands on him. <laughs> While you're doing that, Eric, uh, Faye has asked, how do they find a nest? How do they find a nest? Well, I will get yeah. into that and I'll show you some nesting material in a minute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here you can see... The, the little hummingbird still trying to push him into the water, and it's probably just a play for We're not seeing your video, Eric. You're not seeing it? Oh, no. no. Okay. All right, for some reason it screwed up there. Share my screen. Okay. Can you see it now? There we go. Now we see the fountain. Okay. So I'm going to just run it ahead here. And this is uh, the little chick playing on the side of the fountain, waiting for the sibling to show up. 
Thanks for that, Randy. If there are problems with the broadcast, please let me know. And thank you. So the little chick is just washing itself. And its brother comes along and pushes him into the pool. Now this is, I know this is not a, uh, a territorial aggressive attack because of the way that he's going at the other sibling, just trying to push him down. If it were really an aggressive attack, they would uh, be poking at each other and there'd be a lot more s directed um, a aggression. But this, in my mind, looks more playful than, than the other. And it's just, there he pushed him into the water. And there he goes away. That seemed to be what he wanted to do. So they do play together for a short period of time, but as you can imagine, after uh, getting pushed into the pool, <laughs> the response may not be as playful. But there they are. And the question about... Um, your, your question there right now, you showed them drowning one another. How often do they fight to the death? Well, it does happen. Um, I have had... Uh, I have seen them knock each other out. I've never seen them kill each other, but I saw one little chick get uh, knocked right out. Now, the question for uh, the nest, was that finding a nest? How do I find a nest, or how do they, how do they find yes, a nest? Yes, how do they find a nest? They asked that. Okay. Yep. So they, they actually make nests uh, two or three a year in most cases, sometimes four. Uh, let me just find the right... Okay. Uh, that's not the right one. Okay, nest building. So they start off with a little bit of fluff and they'll just tack it onto a spot on a branch that they like. Now this happens to be a putting a nest in exactly the same spot as they did the year before. You can see the lower part, uh, this is the old nest hanging down there, which eventually fell off. But the hummingbird goes around and gets little bits of material and puts it on there. And they use things like lichen or spider web or fluff, and I, I put out uh, raw cotton for them to use, and that encourages them to that encourages them to grow a nest. Um, and it takes about 150 to 200 visits before they're able to actually have a nest. Uh, they Eric, lay, Eric, they yes. we have nothing on the screen right now. Okay. I wonder why that's happening. There we go. Is that better? Uh, okay. Now we have a picture. Okay. Working out. Can you see that okay, Randy? Yep, we're seeing it now. Okay. And a couple other so, questions came in. After they sure. fledge, do they still sleep in a nest? No, they don't. They then start to sleep in branches. So they'll find a little spot that they feel safe on, and they'll stay there and sleep in the branches in the trees. Okay, and what size are the smallest and largest hummingbirds approximately? Well, there's a little hummingbird called a bumblebee hummingbird, which is bigger than a bumblebee, but smaller than most other hummingbirds. And they are in the area, the smallest ones are about two grams, uh, two to two and a half grams, and the biggest ones would probably be five or six grams, and that's uh, that would be a hummingbird in South America, which is a fair size hummingbird. Yeah. Okay. Uh, people are asking how can they find a nest, but Kathy's also asked, do they make a new nest for each brood? And did yes, you say do. how many times a summer they will mate and raise babies? <coughs> yeah. Me? So they will, um, they, they, they will, they may have up to four nests per year that I've documented. And uh, they make a new nest for each brood, and they will have overlapping nests. So they may have uh, one uh, nest going while they are building the other nest. And they might be sitting on eggs while they're feeding the chicks. What we're looking at here now is actual video of me finding a nest. You may have been able to see the little bird flip, flitting through the screen. And the chick 
is actually Eric, surfing. Eric, we have no the... video again. Oh. Eric, video. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to start this back here because this is actually finding a hummingbird nest. Now, this is how I tend to do it as I listen to the birds. You can hear her chirping away, and she's probably trying to chase off a crow or some other predator in her territory. But because I know what they sound like and what they sort of behave like, I'm able to determine that she's trying to protect her nest. So I was able to track her while filming, and I could see that uh, she disappeared onto this branch. So as I focused in on the branch, there was her nest, and very hard to see. If she wasn't sitting on it, it would be almost impossible to find, because it just blends in with the rest of the tree. Does that make sense? And why do some migrate and others don't? Well, that's a good question. And I don't know that there's really much of a, um, an answer to that. The, the, um, uh, some migrate to keep warm and for food. Those are probably the main reasons. Uh, and the hummingbirds here, because they uh, have food all year round, are able to stay all year round. If we have a hard winter, it may kill a whole bunch of the hummingbirds. But for the most part, there's a lot of food here. Now here's a uh, little hummingbird chasing or attempting to chase off an owl. But of course, owls don't really give a hoot. So they're happy to stay there and just watch the birds themselves. This particular owl at one point had about six or seven hummingbirds going around him to... Uh, try to drive him off, but he wasn't really having any of it, and he just continued to stay there and sleep. This is a barred owl. Hey, uh, and from Matt, he's saying he heard on the NPR that the drought is affecting mig migratory patterns. Have you heard anything around that? I haven't heard anything about that, but that doesn't surprise me. I would expect that it would. Um, bir hummingbirds have a strong sight fidelity, which means that they are often going to go back to the same spot that they went that they were in the year before. So if a hummingbird has a particular pattern, uh, as far as stopping off and getting food and making a nest, uh, if say that little valley that they went to to get some particular food on their way up to North America or through North America uh, gets decimated by a drought, they may not have that food there, so they would have to move somewhere else. Uh, so that makes a lot of sense. They're very sensitive as far as uh, location and environment. Now here I'm going to show you And are you showing us another of... picture? Uh, it's another I don't clip. see another Can picture. Okay. Nope, not yet. Okay. Just a minute. And while you're looking there, Mernie says, what is your ratio uh, for your feeders here in B.C.? Well, in the, most of the year, I'll use four cups of water to one cup of sugar. And then when it gets really cold, I'll go three cups of water to one cup of sugar. But usually not beyond that. Uh, beyond that, it becomes probably a little bit too strong for them. The four to one ratio seems to be the most natural. And then they can supplement their diet with bugs and things like that. But if you get, uh, uh, you don't want to go too much more than than three to one when it's really cold and they can't find bugs. So I'm going to show you one more clip here. Uh, this is a clip of a hummingbird coming home to a nasty visitor. She's checking on her chicks and has to drive away the caterpillar. And she quite successfully defends her chicks from the evil caterpillar. All right.
So that's all the time we've got today. Um, unless anybody has any more questions, I'll do my best to feed them, or <laughs> best to feed them, best to answer them. I think we've got them all. How long do they live? Well, some hummingbirds uh, have been documented at 11 to 12 years old. Those would be birds that they've banded. Uh, but most, it seems like the average lifespan is about three years or so. But they, I think there's just a lot of things that uh, cut down on their lifespan. They're so fragile. Well, thank you very much, uh, Randy. If you have anything to say at this point, uh, I'm pretty much done and I think we'll probably do this again in the near future. I'll certainly put it out to everybody that shows up and uh, pu I'll put it on my Facebook page, Hummingbirds Up Close. I'd like to thank the Canadian Wildlife Federation for putting this on and uh, keep in touch. If anybody has any more questions, my Facebook page is Hummingbirds Up Close and you can reach me through there. So thank you very much and over to you, Randy. Or not. A lot, Eric. That was wonderful. Great videos and everything. I've just added in there my email address again. So if people have any further questions, they can either contact me or yourself. I'm sure, Eric. If there's future little webinars you would like to see, please let me know some topics, and we'll start putting them together. I know Eric does a great job with his hummingbirds, and I know he'd be wonderfully interested in doing a few more. And the other thing is, this is being recorded, so all I need is if people need it, send me an email, and I will definitely forward to you the archive site where it can be picked up from. All right, anything else? And after that, we are fine. And yes, Faye, we will be putting it up for viewing again. That's why I'm just saying, if you'd like to know where it is, please let me know, and I will make sure that you get it. Okay, thank you very much, Randy, and I'm, I'm cutting out.